There's just so much to know. Well, I'm going to do the best I can in the time that I have to try to tell you just a little about honeybees. So, what do you know about honeybees? Well, there's one thing I know about honeybees, and that's the more you know about them, the more you realize how much more there is to know about them. They're amazing, interesting, fascinating little creatures. So where do we start? Well, let's start with the queen in the center of this picture. Now, I know being a queen sounds like something you might want to be, but that's really not the case with honeybees. Her only job in the colony is to lay eggs. And it looks like she's found a cell ready to lay one in. There's actually three types of bees in the hive. The queens, the workers, and the drones. This queen is surrounded by worker bees. And all the worker bees are female. The first two or three weeks of their life are spent inside the hive as house bees. Cleaning and feeding, building comb, cooling and warming the hive. And finally guarding the entrance before they fly out to become foragers, gathering supplies for the hive. Nectar, pollen, propolis, and water. And she's found another cell to lay another egg in. You can see the circle of bees around her. That's her court. They feed her, tend her needs, just so she can continue her job of laying eggs. And when the colony's small in the spring, she normally lay only as many eggs as there are nurse bees to take care of them. As the colony grows, she'll lay more sometimes up to around 1,500 eggs a day when the colony reaches peak population of 45,000 to 60,000 bees. Each hive normally has one queen. She can live up to four to five years. The workers can live up to four to five months in the winter, but in the summer, they work themselves to death in about six weeks. This is a cutaway of a cell showing an egg, and this is how the queen places it in the bottom of the cell, right near the center in this position. And these are the eggs of a new queen that's just starting to lay. She's just not quite all in the center, but she'll get better with practice. This is looking down into the comb. Inside the circle, you can see the stages of development. The egg hatches into a larva in three days. The larva grows four to five days until it's capped and begins to weave a cocoon entering its pupil stage. These caps have been opened on the cell so you can see the pupa. The older they are, the darker the eyes. The three dots in the middle of their head are called ocelli or false eyes. They pick up light and dark and quick movement. These are drone pupa, the males in the hive. Their bodies are larger than the workers and they have really large eyes. These adult drones are hatching out of their cells. They start by chewing the cap away, then enlarging the opening so they can squeeze out. You can see the smaller size worker cells in the bottom of the picture. The workers hatch out of their cells in the same way, but drones hatch out in 24 days workers hatch out in 21 days, and the queens in 16. When the drones and workers hatch out of their cells, they're full size, but they tend to look a little fuzzy like this newborn worker. That look doesn't last long, and they get right to work. I'm often asked where the wax for the comb comes from. Well, it comes from these wax glands on the underside of the abdomen of house bees, starting around 12 days old. Now some beekeepers use full sheets of beeswax foundation in their hives for bees to build their comb on. But the bees do a pretty good job in building comb on their own. So in this case, the bees have been given a starter strip of beeswax foundation to start the comb on. They hang barrel a monkey style with their legs hooked together and pass the wax platelets up the chain where the bees form the comb from the top down. This is called festooning. You can see here how they've started to build a comb down on the starter strip. This older, darker comb is old wax. It's being reused from another part of the hive that they'll add new wax to as they need it. You can see them chewing and forming the cells on the edge of the comb. Did 
I say something about bees always building the comb from the top down? Well, in this case, they were allowed too much room for a little too long and decided to build comb from the bottom up. But at least they appear to have reinforced a large wall with buttresses or bracing of some sort to keep it from falling over. You just never know what goes on in the mind of a bee. And while we're talking about the mind of a bee, this is a beekeeping behavior that no one's been able to figure out yet. It's called washboarding. The bees set their back two sets of legs and sweep with their front two legs, their mandibles, and their antenna. They do it on painted surfaces and on wood. But yet nobody understands it. Maybe one day you'll be able to find the answer to why they do this. Everyone knows and understands this behavior. These are bees bringing in pollen. The pollen's brought back to the hive in what are sometimes called pollen baskets, but they're not really baskets. They're just longer hairs on the back legs of the bee where the pollen can be packed into pellets to be taken back to the hive, where it's placed in the comb. There it's mixed with a little nectar, or honey, and packed into the cell. And at that point, it becomes something called bee bread. Well, this isn't pollen this forager has in her baskets. This is a substance called propolis. It's made from the sap and the resins of trees and plants. It has a consistency of taffy, so it's really soft and sticky when it's warm and really hard and brittle when it's cold. It's a natural antiseptic and has many uses in the hive. We'll put a coating on the inside of the hive and even put a thin coating on the bottom of the cells before the eggs are laid to control germs. They'll use it to fill up cracks in the hive. And they'll also use it to reduce the size of the hive entrances to keep out the cold in the winter. They can also put a real thin coating of propolis on things that have gotten into the hive that have died or were killed and were too big to carry out. The propolis keeps the germs from spreading as the critter decays. Now here's a frame of honey that the bees make from the nectar that they gather. But how do we get that honey in a jar? Well, it's a process called extraction. First, we'll take a knife of sorts to cut the wax cappings off the cell. Some use heated knives or other kind of knives, but I like to use serrated bread knives. Watch and cut the cappings off that comb. The dark spots in the comb are some pollen that's been put in the same cells with the honey. But sometimes a knife can't get all the capping, so we'll just use a capping scratcher to scratch the cappings off to open the cells. Then the open frame of honey is put in the basket of the extractor and spun around. This throws the honey onto the side of the tank in the extractor. And the honey runs down to the bottom where we open a valve and let the honey run through a coarse screen to strain out the pieces of wax. It goes into a bottling bucket and then into the jars. Well, this is more honey, but obviously it's still in the hive. This comb was open when I was taking the top box of the hive off. Bees don't like to waste anything, so they're drinking this up so they can take it down into the comb to store it in a better and hopefully a safer place. Unfortunately, bees look for food wherever they can find it, and at times during the year, there's not much nectar available. These foraging bees from a large strong hive 
discovered this small weak hive and came at it with force in a robbing frenzy. Once they start robbing, it's hard to stop. Most often the smaller hive is lost and the queen is killed. Here's a photo of a foraging worker bee near the end of her life. She's flown till the wings have become tattered. She'll die off on her own. Well, often in the spring, colonies of bees swarm. The queen's been laying a lot of eggs, and the foragers have been bringing in lots of food. The population have grown, and there's a lot less room in the hive. So at this time, the bees often start raising new queens. But before the new queens hatch, the existing queen will leave the hive, but sometimes up to half the colony, and swarm out to a resting spot. Scout bees will fly out to find a new location of the swarm to move into. But these bees swarmed into a tree around lots of people. So the safest way to capture them was using a bee vacuum. It took the bees about five minutes to form this cluster, but it took me about 20 minutes to vacuum them up. Banging on a pot. They seem to have, don't they? Old timers have been using this method to bring down swarms for years. Don't know why it works, but it almost always does. Beekeepers often get calls to retrieve swarms in the spring, and there's really none better than finding one like this. We get to a spot where there's bees hanging off a tree and the people say, I don't care what you do, cut the limb, whatever it takes, get these bees out of here. So we'd set up a ladder. And then you got to be really careful about trimming the excess limbs off. You, you're going to cut them, you got to watch what you're doing. You don't want to shake them off of that limb because they're already settled in and you don't want to knock them all off and get them back in the air because they may settle back down again, but it may be at a different spot that won't be as easy to get to. You got to be real careful cutting that limb. There's about maybe about five pounds of bees on there, and that springy little limb uh, gets you in trouble if it flips up. There, got it. No problem. Walk carefully down the ladder. To an open cardboard box. Put the limb and bees and apples and all in the box. Get the excess limbs off so they can get the lid closed. And I can use some duct tape, tape the box up, and get them home. And when I get them home, I got to get them back in the box. And I just set up a little small hive here, a little five frame newt. Laid a blanket down in front of it in the grass so when I dump the bees out, they don't get all involved, tangled up in it. So I get the tape off the box and open the box up real slow, and you can see they're still not upset. Bees don't have anything to protect when they're swarming, so they normally aren't very defensive. Now, the biggest thing you have to worry about is grabbing a hold of one because when you pinch them, they're more than likely you'll get stung. You be careful. Just grab the limb, shake the bees, and looks like a few apples off. Under the blanket, in front of the box. And then you just shake the bees out of the cardboard box. And it's, it's a little rough, maybe, but hey, you gotta get them out of the box, you know? And it doesn't take long for the bees to find the opening on their new home. They all just start parading in. Now the queen doesn't necessarily go in first. She'll often go in sometimes in the middle. But that's a new box and they're all heading in. That's to their new home.
I just got a little curious here towards the end and thought I'd pick a frame out and peek down inside and see how things are going. And sure enough, what did I happen to see? There's that new little queen. Already in her new home. Now this is a swarm that's out on the ground and I'm trying to position this little nuke in a spot so I can get the bees to walk into it. Usually if you put a box down near a swarm, they just hike right into it, just like the ones I dumped out in front. Once the queen and several of the bees are inside the hive, the bees start a behavior called fanning. Now they have a nasinov gland in the very end of their abdomen. It puts out a pheromone. Pheromones are very important to the function of the hive. Even larvae put off a pheromone that governs behavior. But in this instance, it's the Nasanov gland that puts out a pheromone that tells the bees this is where home is. This is where we all are. This is where you need to be. They put their little abdomen up in the air, bend the tip of it over, and exposing this Nasanov gland, and fan with their wings just as fast as they can. Put that pheromone out in the air and let everybody know where home is. These are queen cells. Bees generally make more queens than they need. And since they just need one queen, often the first queen that hatches will sting the other unhatched queens in their cells. The workers will chew a hole in the side and carry out the dead queens, and then life goes on. Hear that? That's called piping. Sometimes two queens will hatch out in different locations in the hive, and this is what you get. One queen piping at the other, or calling at the other queen, trying to locate her so they can get together and have a battle, and whichever one wins is the queen of the hive. Let's listen to this. But now if you see a swarm of bees, don't get upset. Remember, it's just a swarm of bees, and they're not looking to sting you. They're just looking for a new home. You'll see them on trees, and you'll see some on fence posts. You'll see them on cars. you would be able to see them anywhere, even flat on the ground. They're just waiting for scouts to come back to find a new home. And there's also the other thing. If you see bees in a structure, in a house, in a barn, give us a call. Beekeepers will take them out for you. I've been called for bees in the bottom of old rotted out power poles that have built their colony from ground level down. And then there's this old colony that was built in the header of an old rusty combine that was going to be hauled off for scrap. They had themselves really wound up in this and I had to cut them out in pieces. It wasn't very pretty. Now here's a quick look at 45 minutes of a removal from a house. Shortened up to about a minute and 38 seconds. I take the vac and vacuum off the excess bees. Then I'll cut off a piece of the comb with my knife, take it down, and fasten it in a wooden frame to be put in the hive, and go back for some more. Got to work slow and deliver it around them, and they're usually fine. You'll often find the queen in the very last corner, but when you're vacuuming bees, you often get them in the vacuum, and you never really see them. This is a picture of the bee vac you've seen a couple little shots of. I'll show you what it looks like when you got the bees vacked up inside. It's got a screened in box that the bees are vacked in, a lower vacuum so they aren't killed. 
can't see through the screen well, but it's probably around 25 or 30,000 bees. So, do beekeepers get stung? Sure we do. It's part of the deal, but we're cutting into their combs and we're invading their homes, so they don't leave their hive looking for somebody to sting. Unfortunately, when they do, their barb stinger catches in our elastic skin and pulls the stinger out and the bees will die in about two and a half or three minutes. But not always. I was filming this bee with my new camera to get a good motion picture of this stinging bee here and she didn't want to pull away. She just pulls almost to the pointer pulling her stinger out, grabs all of it with her back leg and just keeps spinning around until she works herself free. And she'll fly off to sting again. But I just can't stress enough how gentle bees are. If you work around them slowly and carefully and with respect, like most other living things, you're going to find out you're going to get along just fine with them. These are African bees, the African killer bees. Yeah, this is... And they just acting like any old bee anywhere. Now this is a close-up picture of a varroa mite. They're a parasite to the honeybees. And a big problem to beekeepers. The red female on the left crawls into the cell before it's capped. She then lays eggs that hatches more female offspring that feed on the pupa. Now you can see in this shot the red females that are crawling around on the young pupa that have just recently been capped. The cells were torn open in an inspection of the hive. Some strains of bees have the genetic tendency to open the cells that are infested with the mite and interrupting the brood cycle. If you look closely at the worker in the little lower center of your picture there, you'll see a mite. There it is. It comes crawling out and sitting on the back of her thorax. She needs to be content, bee and the mite. Then this big old drone comes walking across the back, beating it with his wings. It kind of disturbs the mite. Makes it kind of get out and walk around in circles on the back. Then it gets between the thorax and the abdomen. Really annoys that poor little worker. And even though you can see it sitting underneath the clear wing, and she's obviously bothered, she's got a job to do, and she continues. Seeing the varroa mites on the back of our bees, especially our queen bees, isn't a very comforting sight to a beekeeper. But the real damage is done when they get in between the segments under the abdomen, and start eating the fat bodies, and spreading their viruses. Another somewhat larger pest has come into our area around 10 years ago. They're not so much interested in the bee, but they sure do love what's in the beehive. And that's small hive beetles. The problem is the bees can't sting them or grab a hold of them or control them in any other way other than building a little corral or fences that they can herd them behind and keep them from running around on the comb. They try to bite at them and keep them from taking off, but... Sometimes they can't help it. They scoot off across the comb. They still, they work hard to keeping them in their little corrals, placing guards at either end. But if they get out, they lay their eggs in the cells anywhere there's food for protein and their larva hatches. And as it grows, it starts to take over the comb. The hive is already weak to begin with, but with this kind of infestation, it starts to smell, the comb gets slimy, and it doesn't take very long before the bees leave the hive. The larva of the wax moth is another pest that can ruin the comb and make the bees leave the hive. The hive already being weak, the moths get in and lay their eggs, and the larva hatches and then starts making a home in the comb. Looks for whatever food there may be available, weaving webs, defecating, making the hive a literal mess. The comb's ruined. There's the cocoons.
This hive was abandoned and the wax moths moved in. Even though the hive might just be weak and the wax moths move in, it doesn't take very long to get the rest of the bees in the hive. And there's a couple of the culprits still crawling around at the bottom of the comb. This cute little mouse isn't so cute, especially if you're a beekeeper and you find one in your hive. In the wintertime, the bees cluster to stay warm. And mice get in and take opportunity to build a nest in their comb and eat up the honey and the pollen that the bees have worked so hard to store. Sometimes they'll eat up so much that the bees don't have anything to eat in the spring. Another fuzzy animal that bothers our bees are skunks. They come by the hive at night scratch around on the entrance and when the bees come to investigate see what's going on well then they eat them they chew them up suck the juices out of them and spit them out on the ground and then there's this insect it's a wheel bug a type of an assassin bug they're not a huge threat to the hive they take out a bee or two every so often normally in the fall and you don't want to be bitten by one of them, as I understand. They really, really hurt. They'll just take a bee out here and there. And they're just fascinating to watch. The winters are really hard on bees. The cold's bad enough, but the bees might starve without enough food. Many beekeepers feed their hives pollen substitute or sugar in some sort to make sure the bees have enough to eat until spring. And then, this is what my bees see in the spring. Not a flower patch for miles. Now, even though bees can fly up to three miles for food, this landscape makes even that a challenge. In the last 60 years, many of the small farms in this area have disappeared, along with their yards and their pastures and their trees and their fence rows. They used to provide valuable food sources for the bees and for the pollinators. Pollinator programs are now being made available to farmers to help promote food sources for a variety of native pollinators, but there's not much evidence of that here. chemical use in agriculture has been increasing and along with it increasing concern on its effects on people and pollinators. This plane is spraying fungicides on the cornfield next to my beehives and he's totally within proper guidelines for use. And you see the bees flying? And you know there's other pollinators flying too. These biocides, that is the pests and the weed killers used by farmers, they're kind of like the medicines and the chemicals we use around our homes. If they're used unnecessarily, or used without following the proper instructions, they can harm our pollinators and our pets and us. So what are we going to do? Well, we all need to start thinking more like beekeepers. Let those dandelions grow. Let your yard get a little out of hand with the white Dutch clover. we got to realize that a beekeeper is not just someone who keeps bees in hives, but it can also be someone who grows lots of natural chemical-free flowers that bees can use to gather healthy food. So even if you don't have bees, you can still be a beekeeper. Just plant some more flowers. You can plant one flower in a flower pot, or two flowers in two pots, or maybe plant some flowers alongside your sidewalk going up your door, or maybe a couple flower beds on either side of your porch, or or just let your whole yard grow up in flowers. Just plant something. And just sit back and enjoy your bees. Now 
I know all of us don't have big fields to plant flowers in. Just plant what you can. Because whatever we do for the bees, we do for all the pollinators. And we do for us.